Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join us. I'm Ashlyn Burgett, your moderator for today's webinar. I would like to welcome everyone to today's session on web application vulnerabilities. This is the first installment of our Think Like a Hacker webinar series, and we're so excited to get started. Let's go over a few things before we dive into our discussion. All attendees will be muted throughout the session. This session is also being recorded, and all attendees will be receiving a link to the recording, as well as a copy of the slides in your inbox tomorrow. Just a little bit of background about who we are before we get started. Kirkpatrick Price is a licensed CPA firm in PCI QSA, providing assurance services to clients worldwide. Our firm has over 13 years of experience in information assurance by performing assessments, audits, and tests that strengthen information security and compliance controls. We offer information services such as audits and pen testing, as well as readiness and guidance on frameworks such as SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC for Cybersecurity, PCI DSS, HIPAA, HITRUST CSF, FISMA, ISO, and GDPR. We also encourage you to connect with us by subscribing to our blog, visiting our library of recorded webinars so you can catch up on any series at any time, and following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. I'd also like to remind everyone that this presentation is provided by Kirkpatrick Price for educational and or informational purposes only and does not constitute as legal advice. No attorney-client relationship is established by viewing this presentation, so should you need legal advice, please consult with your attorney. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Stuart Rohr is a penetration tester here at Kirkpatrick Price, and he has more than 10 years of experience in security testing. He has a wide range of experiences, but his focus has been on mobile and web applications as well as IoT devices. He also holds a variety of certifications that make him more than qualified to be speaking to us today about pen testing. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Stuart, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm really happy to be presenting this uh, topic to you. I think you'll find it uh, quite a surprise because um, while a lot of this is covered within uh, the OWASP top 10, what we thought would be really special would be to combine a set of vulnerabilities that we actually find uh, commonly when we're assessing a web applications. And while a lot of them go hand in hand with OWASP, um, it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit different. Uh, and, and we thought we would sort of put some highlights on there. Uh, with that being said, I do advise everyone, if they have the time to go out and look at the OWASP top 10 page, it's very in-depth and detailed, and um, especially for the developers, helping them to uh, understand certain vulnerabilities to go through and uh, actually provide some pretty good advice on remediations. But uh, for now, you can see here our agenda. Uh, we're going to be discussing some topics such as you know, web pages versus web applications. We're going to jump right into that top five common vulnerabilities. And then we'll also provide a little bit of information on how to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Let's see here. Okay, so first things first. A lot of times there's a little bit of confusion between um, web pages and web applications. And right here I sort of put up a little bit of a comical uh, situation. Uh, on the left you see what we used to be used to, say back in the, the 90s with the static web pages and uh, people would use them for all sorts of things. Uh, the key word there is it's static, that there really is no dynamic um, element to it. There really wasn't something that, like an input box that you would put in a query or um, necessary or even like a forum where you would chat back and forth. Uh, there wasn't a, a some type of service that would um, after receiving input would go on the back end do some calculations and, and bring something forward. You know of course as the internet has progressed what we began to see were web applications that provided that type of dynamic uh, content that I was just referring to. And on the right, we have an example of, say, for instance, Jimmy John's, very popular fast food uh, restaurant that you can order your food online. 
Um, you can store your favorite orders. You can do a whole bunch of things. And, and of course, that's just a small example. There are tons of web applications out there, web applications that uh, contain medical information and you can contact your doctor, medical um, web applications that you can track scores and create fantasy football teams. There's so many different types of things now that you can do. And so the primary difference and uh, that we want you to understand is, again, static, there really wasn't much interaction other than just looking at a basic page. But now with web applications, you can do so much. And a lot of that is dependent on the user input. And that's going to be key for us because that is where web applications start to get into trouble. So web pages versus web applications. We just talked about this. Um, you know, a web application with its dynamic nature performs a service uh, for the user, whether it be something as simple as uh, a search result. Um, we talked about ordering, all those types of things um, are, are possibilities. And it's that interaction and functionality that can enlarge the potential surface uh, or the attack surface for the web application. So with a simple web page, other than viewing the page itself, there is usually very little that can be attacked aside from the underlying infrastructure. And that's what we typically saw back in the 90s. Whenever you saw a uh, some sort of hacking attempt performed, it was usually after someone had broken into, say, a uh, poorly secured FTP server, and then they would get in, they would alter the web page a little bit, and that's where you'd see the skull and the flames or something, you know, similarly ridiculous. And, you know, that was the, the primary form of attack. Now that's different because with that added dynamic functionality, and again, we talked about the other types of options that you can now do, they interact with things on the back end. So we're talking about web applications that run your user queries on a database on the back end. Maybe it is pulling a whole bunch of users and returning information on that. Maybe it's searching through a list of accounts, like a banking application. All of these things are interacting through that user input with the operating system, with uh, underlying services like the database, and any of those, meaning the database, the operating system, whatever's involved, they start to become in that area that we call the attack surface something that could potentially be attacked. And that's a scary thing because all of this is occurring through a very common, seemingly harmless, you know, interface of a web application. So before we get to the vulnerabilities, we first need to realize that each web application is a unique construct. And so when we assess these, you come across different frameworks and components, libraries, services, and we've talked about some of those services so much more. Um, you know, I, I think of how a lot of people say that um, you know no snowflake is alike, and you know everybody has a unique and different fingerprint, and, and that's so true with web applications as well. You know, I might be testing one one week that's using Django, um, and then the next week I'm testing one that's using you know Strut. Um, and each of those frameworks, the application itself, the content, who's using it, it all creates this unique and different environment. And so with that said, we have to realize that um, there's never a one-size-fits-all solution for a web application, and that's important when it comes time to look at securing your application. Just because, for instance, one company has been able to implement this and do that, that doesn't necessarily mean that will work for yours. And so with them differing uh, from another so vastly, uh, you know, again, your web application might be purely safe when it comes to, say, um, authorization issues. But, you know, it might turn out that because you are using a templating engine that it's vulnerable to a template injection. So considering this, it is true that certain security issues seem to appear more often in security testing than others. Um, what we have found that even though applications differ, there's usually um, some vulnerabilities that seem to pop up with each one. So while 
again, we'll use the example we just used. Let's say that you know authorization issues for you have not been an issue, but you implement that templating engine, you're subject to that template injection. Um, with that being said, uh, there might be some other issues that uh, your application will suffer from. And we'll, a lot of these will actually appear to be low level issues. And that's one of the things we'll be talking about. And it's these issues that a lot of times developers feel are not so you know, keen on fixing because they think that they're just so benign. But you'll find that sometimes they can actually be combined into a larger attack. So again, with that being said, uh, to summarize this again, each web application is different. Um, there, there's none that are completely alike, and you're going to find certain issues within some where others won't have those, but there is very often a common subset of issues that you will find among many different applications. So now we are brought to our top five common vulnerabilities found during web app pen tests. And again, let me reiterate that, you know, we're not trying to compete with OWASP top 10. We're not trying to say that we know better. We're just saying, hey, you know, in our testing experience, these are the ones that we often find that we're often having talks with developers about. And so we thought it would be interesting just to sort of bring these forward and share our knowledge and experience regarding these issues. And so the top five that we have written down, uh, as you can see, are misconfiguration, uh, vulnerable third-party libraries and components, we talked about it just a second ago, authorization issues. We've also seen a lot of redirection issues. And of course, again, a lot of people, when they think of web security issues, they almost always associate that with injections. And we'll go over these here one-on-one uh, -on -one as we continue. So to start with, misconfigurations. What do I mean by that? Well, misconfigurations are typically along the lines of where the web application, uh, the frameworks, whatever it's been developed in, um, and even on sometimes on the server side that certain configurations that could be more secure have not been performed. They've been forgotten. Maybe somebody's left some defaults in. It's still not uncommon to find that someone has left a default account. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're talking more along the lines of, say, cookies and information leakage and even headers that are very important to protecting the application that often just get left, um, you know, undone. They're not set. Uh, with cookies, and we'll be getting to that here next, you know, a lot of times we see that the HTTP only flag is missing um, or the secure flag is missing or both is missing. Uh, information leakage. A lot of times we'll see an application reveal internal IP addresses or they'll print out stack traces that gives an idea of what's going on behind the scenes or um, they'll reveal banner information that tells us what platform is running and what version it is. And all these things can help an attacker to launch a more specific attack on the application itself. And not just specific, but a lot of times more successful. So the first one we were talking about was lacking proper cookie protection. And I mentioned the HTTP only and secure flags. Well, what do they do? So the HTTP only flag, uh, when it was created, its purpose was to prevent, uh, say, client side code from being able to access a cookie file. Um, and uh, what would happen in the past was without that protection, if someone was able for instance, to put in some injected code that could, you know, copy the value of an authenticated user's cookie, then it could potentially store that somewhere else where the attacker could get to it, copy that session, and then use that session, you know, pretending to be the user. So that flag, the HTTP only flag, was implemented so that that would be harder to achieve, not uh, impossible because it still is through certain types of other vulnerabilities for that to be achieved, but it makes it a lot harder. And so we always advise that that flag be set specifically um, on any type of session cookies, but preferably um, on any type of thing that could be sensitive to the application and the way the application works. 
Uh, likewise, the secure flag was created so that a cookie in transit would be um, required to go over um, an encrypted channel. Uh, for instance, uh, HTTPS is what we're talking about primarily here. And it was so that the cookie would not come across in clear text. And that was a problem, another problem that used to occur quite often. Without that flag set, the cookie would go through clear text HTTP. Um, again, if it was something like a session ID, it could be copied and then used by an attacker to, um, you know, take over, say, another user's session. Um, sometimes, scary enough, and this in itself is something of a security issue, a lot of cookies can contain valuable um, information to the user. And um, so anything like that that might have sensitive information should also bear that secure flag. And so hopefully, you know, when people develop their applications, you're hoping that they are using that flag on the cookies. But often we find that it's, it's left off. Um, and of course, right here at the bottom, we have an example of a flag or, or the flag's not being set on uh, the cookie. It's being uh, created. And this is a session cookie. So that's very important that that flag, that it be flagged, excuse me, with both of those. Um, and again, very common that we would see that. Now, the problem that we have is a lot of developers, again, will often feel that, oh, well, well you know, it's not really necessary, or, you know, it's really only necessary on just that session ID. But again, you know, all, all applications are different. And let's say that you have a cookie that contains information regarding what's in a user's cart, um, or, you know, it might contain um, something about the user's role or uh, URLs they visited. I mean, it, it's hard to say each application functions so differently, but any type of information that's specific to a user, you definitely want to make sure that those flags are set. Um, you know, again, it's sort of a better safe than sorry approach. Information leakage uh, is another common one that we see. And again, a lot of people see that as low level. Uh, we're talking about revealing banners, as you can see in the example below, uh, where it's, it's telling us what's running in the background in and the version numbers. We're talking about stack traces um, and user information, which I believe I have some examples of here um, upcoming. And information leakage, again, often seen as just a real non-issue, but it is. You know, a lot of these small issues, if you can lump them together, can become quite huge, especially if you're ever able to get a foothold onto the application in the form of like an injection attack. Let's say, for instance, that um, you know, you're able to perform a successful cross-site scripting injection in a web application, and the session cookies are not containing that flag for the HTTP only. Well, then potentially that cookie is going to be vulnerable to that person creating an attack that's going to copy that value and put it somewhere they can have access to. Let's say that um, you know your application is running a vulnerable version of say Acme 1.2 server. Well, and then in your banners, you're revealing that that's what you're running. So when the attacker is looking over the application and then they see that, they they do research and find that that thing you know, that you know particular version is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. Well, then there we go. So that leads them to that trying to that type of attack. And then again, we use that example of that cookie. So then they know that they can do that. So you can see what I mean by stair-stepping. You know, sometimes you create a snowball effect. Just leaving multiple issues like this out just because they seem like a non-issue can so easily manifest into something larger. Here we have an example of a stack trace. I come across these very often. And again, I usually get a little bit of a uh, bite when you know, I bring these to the attention of the developers. I, I never really flag them unless they contain super sensitive information as anything higher than a low finding, but they are still a finding because a lot of times, and, and not so much in this example, but um, in other examples, um, I you know, have seen them where they have printed out sensitive information, such as the actual generation of security keys and the formula that they're using to do so. Um, in this example right here, we, we can see that they're using XML as they're parsing XML to some degree. So that might tell me right there that the application could be vulnerable to some form of XML injection. 
we see the mention of Java. Well, Java has had its set of, you know, vulnerabilities. That gives me a little bit of information on how to, you know, dig more into the application. Maybe there's some deserialization attacks I can perform. Again, all of this leads um, into more information for that attacker to try to launch something more successful on your application. Here we have an example of um, user enumeration, another one that just seems, you know, passe. Uh, a lot of applications really don't care that they tell you that a user doesn't exist inside the system, but hey, that tells me that I can input a whole bunch of suspected users into your application. And if it gives me a message like, we don't recognize this email or user doesn't exist, guess what? Now I know that that user isn't in the, in the system. And if I get something that says something different, like, um, you know, it actually takes me to a reset area or um, something that confirms the user does exist, then I can start creating a list of potential users to brute force and to try to break into their accounts. And maybe there's a weak password. There usually is. Uh, maybe there's another way. Maybe it's going to ask me a simple question like, where were you born? Well, there's a lot of services out there that people can use to, to find that information out very, very easily. Birthdays, very easy. Um, so, again, something so small really isn't that insignificant. Headers are another area that we see lacking in applications. And this one I will admit is hard because there are so many headers out there, you know, headers for protecting against cross-site scripting and as we're talking about here with, you know, protecting against like click jacking, um, just a whole slew of, of headers out there. So when developers are working on the application and whatever framework they're working in and the server infrastructure, they have to sort of go through quite a few hoops sometimes to figure out how to employ these and how is it going to affect the application this is probably one of the biggest uh, headers that give developers the most trouble because for some reason a lot of developers like to use that feature of being able to embed a page in their application and if these headers are implemented it really messes with that and it will sometimes prevent them from being able to render uh, what they want to correctly. Um, however, the X-Frame options being set to deny is a very important header it is one of the you know better ways of protecting against click jacking, which is taking a page, let's say a login page, and then embedding it in say a page that you've created. Um, so imagine, if you will, that you have a website, and let's say that uh, you and a whole bunch of friends belong to a certain uh, message board. I, I know they're that's old, but let's pretend that we're back in that time. Anyway, so you all belong to it. You have a web page, like a blog, and you, you talk about all the things that you like and your friends visit it every day. And so just as a convenience, you decide that, hey, you know what, why make them have to type something in to you know, the address bar? Why not just embed that login page in my page so that they can access it there? And hey, guess what? They're not only gonna access it inside my blog, but they get to keep, they get to stay on my blog, so they're not having to go away. Well, that's pretty much what, you know, an iframe does um, or embedding a, a page within a page. And so with this type of uh, settings in that header, it actually is supposed to block it or keep it from doing that. And again, most clients feel that it's, it's not a big issue. But again, if this is used in conjunction with other issues, especially social engineering, and as we talk about later, some redirection issues, um, it can actually prove to be dangerous. Uh, a lot of phishing attacks are very successful if they can find a form of click jacking. And here we have an example. This was actually a real web page. I just you know, went out the other day and just looked for um, pages that were missing this. And this was uh, a pretty high profile target that actually still you know, allowed that type of frame um, to be you know, embedded. And I knew why, because they were using multiple systems. You know, so they're trying to keep everybody on one central page so they don't have to go off and you know, multiple directions. Um, and I blocked off, you know, certain details of it. But, you know, uh, this type of thing is a problem because, you know, if, as you can see, 
if somebody was to set up a page pretending to be that login page, they could actually attach um, the putting code that would, when that form is submitted, it actually submit to them the username and the password. And then that would be, of course, uh, again, a really good phishing attack. So now we're moving on to our next issue, which is the, the vulnerable third-party libraries and components. And this is very, very common. Uh, you know, you'll find uh, lots of vulnerable versions of jQuery. Um, and that's a really good example. Again, we've talked about frameworks throughout this discussion, um, all different types that, you know, again, each web application has implemented, um, configured in their own way. Um, some of the people choose to stay up to date on them, some will leave them at older versions. And then, of course, components like Flash still rely, and there are some newer ones as well. You also see every now and then Java applets, hopefully not so much. But, um, you know, all of these uh, are extending what, um, you know, the typical browser is capable of and uh, or even the typical languages that the browser renders. So like jQuery was a way of sort of enhancing uh, some of the simplistic abilities of JavaScript to do so much more. You know, frameworks likewise, you know, it's like a collection of code libraries that you can do some pretty amazing things. And components, you know, we, we are all familiar with Flash, what it's been used for. Um, Silverlight was sort of huge for a while. Um, you know, all to extend, like I said, that basic functionality. So the trouble with jQuery, um, again, it's great for what it does, but it has notoriously had issues over the years, especially with potential um, cross-site scripting injection vectors. And so when you implement jQuery, it's always best to stay on top of the security updates and make sure that you're checking your version against the latest vulnerabilities to make sure that you're not falling within a version that is vulnerable. Um, there are bots out there who just troll through the internet and through pages just looking to see if you're running a version like that. And then once they do, they'll continue to crawl the site to see if you're you know, application is implementing any of those vulnerable functions. So don't think that you have to be targeted, per se, to be attacked. Um, the frameworks, the extensions, the components, lots of issues exist. You know, injections, not just cross-site scripting, but um, other forms of code injection. Um, you have templating issues, which we sort of talked about a little bit. A lot of the new templating frameworks, they are great. They're awesome for really creating quick content um, on the fly, but if they're not secured correctly, you can do some pretty nasty things, including some potential RCE, which stands um, for um, remote code execution, excuse me. And um, also some authorization issues. I've seen that happen as well within the frameworks where, you know, if, again, they're not properly configured and somehow, some way, um, uh, one user is able to access something that they really shouldn't because certain you know, settings, configurations have not been put into play. So that leads us to the question, so what should you consider when deciding on extending your web application? Well, the first thing to remember is that it's never as easy as it seems. Uh, you know, you need to do a lot of research into what you're going to use, the security issues that might be involved. It always helps to, you know, read any type of instructions that come with it, look at examples, and, and just sort of troll yourself through the Internet to see what type of issues have occurred. Look at common vulnerability databases. Um, things like that to see what's going on. And then, of course, always, whenever you make a major change to your web application, consider a pen test, because that's one of the best ways to keep staying on top of uh, security issues. Uh, more importantly, look into, you know, finding a company that does some form of bug bounty or, you know, continuous testing. Um, that could easily help you to stay on top. That way you're not having to pay for a pen test every change. Because, I mean, you're changing your application multiple times a year. You know, with continuous testing, that's a great solution because you have an agreement with a company um, to pretty much just test it, you know, each month, you know, con you know consistently. And um, I happen to know Kirkpatrick Price is one of those. So if you're interested, definitely reach out. Authorization issues. So, that's another issue, uh, very common, 
And um, the first thing I want to, of course, get across is that authentication is very different from authorization. Um, so authentication issues, or excuse me, authorization, I see I did it myself. Um, the, the words are so similar, they're so easy to bleed. So again, <laughs> let's establish the difference where I even trip myself up. So authentication is, are you authorized? See, I did it again. See, I wish some way I can change those words because I, I switched them up myself. No. Authentication is, are you allowed to be here? Um, are you who you say you are? Um, you know, it's a login. Think of a login and thinking, you know, is that person allowed to enter the building? And then let's say that they are. So once they're in the building, are they authorized to go into certain rooms? There we go. You know, I don't know what it is about uh, technology and using words that are so closely knit together, but it is so irritating at times because you get so tongue tied. But there is a difference. And again, so when you think about authorization issues, you're thinking about a user, for instance, that might be already authenticated to the application, but what are they authorized to see and do? And so you, for example, have several roles and uh, we'll take a basic user role. That user role might be permitted to see um, things like uh, a basic, uh, to list their profile, but they shouldn't be able to list, say, another person's profile that person who's a basic user might be able to perform a simple search and create content for themselves, but they shouldn't be able to say add users or remove users. That should be restricted to the uh, admin who would be authorized to do that. And so um, the authorization issues do easily sneak up, um, especially when you have a complex application uh, I've always said that when you're developing session management and authorization issues are always the hardest because especially when you're doing any form of custom things, it's so easily through our own era to, you know, create some sort of logic issues that can be bypassed. And a lot of times when that happens, it will result in forms of what we call IDORs or indirect object references. So here's another fun term. Um, you know, to throw out there. And uh, we actually have an example of that coming up. But if you are having a pen test performed, I, and even if it's not with us, always make sure that they are testing a variety of user roles because if they're not, they're not really getting the whole picture and they're going to have a lot harder time trying to identify authorization issues. Um, there are on you know, the flip side, authentication issues with applications, um, you know, and of course for that, we're talking more along the lines of login. Um, you know, I think of uh, a lot of the like single sign-ons and things like that are now, now being used. A lot of those are, are you know, tested. Um, but again, with authorization issues, those are more insidious, and sneaky, and they're harder to find. And uh, usually after doing some digging, um, when you do find them, they can lead to sometimes a complete takeover of the application, just depending on how far they go. So here's an example of, you know, of an authorization issue, and we have what is an HTTPS our post, and it's going to access this user's profile area, and at the bottom we see some of our parameters. We have a token, we have a user, we have our cookie up here above, and um, so what it's doing is it's, it's checking, you know, maybe with that token um, and my username to make sure that I am authorized. And if the application's working correctly, what it should do is it should do something like in the combination of check that session to make sure it's tied to the right user and that that token is also tied to the correct user. And then it's going to look and see, okay, this is user Stuart. Um, is that who is logged in? You know, um, is that who that token belongs to? If I change that user to Bob, you know, it should fail. It should tell me, you know, not authorized. Um, it might even kick me out of the application, um, things like that. Uh, however, if an indirect object reference occurs, if I change that name, say, to um, Rachel, um, and it allows me to view her profile, well, that's a problem. And there you have an example of an authorization issue.
redirection issues. Ah, oh, they are so common. I, I would have to say that over the last year, I see them in at least every other or maybe every two applications. Uh, they also appear very harmless. And uh, a lot of times it's very possible um, to control that URL in which a user is redirected. And we talked about using certain tax in the past, you know, with, um, we were talking about click jacking. This is another one that's really um, good to use when you're wanting to do a phishing attack. If you can find a redirection within an application that you can control, you could potentially send a user to a malicious URL of your choosing. And um, right there, you know, I'm showing you what looks like a typical redirection. Um, a lot of times, you have to remember web applications are being updated all the time. And let's say that there's a company merger and now they're wanting to, you know, uh, take where users used to go when they log in and push them over to this, this new company subpage. Um, you know, they might in, insert like a redirect here. Now, if we can find a perimeter that would allow us to control that URL, then we have a redirection issue. So, uh, there are other ways, of course, of injecting um, for redirection. Some of them uh, I've found are through using the exported headers. Um, sometimes by just injecting those within your request or post, um, it will actually uh, allow you to um, change what happens on the subsequent page, the response, to where maybe a link being clicked will lead into an actual redirection. Again, we talked about perimeters being an issue. Uh, we can find a perimeter, you know, that references a URL that we can change. Um, then all we have to do is just put it to the malicious target we want and let it rip. And and we talked about, uh, you know, the harm in that. You know, it seems so, you know, harmless. But uh, if we're sending a person to a site that contains malware that happens to be a zero day and it can attack even the latest version of Google, that's a problem. Um, you know, what if it uh, redirects to an active exploit on the own application? And that's, that's also another issue I found. You know, sometimes the redirection, it might only work within the domain of the application. And so developers are thinking, well, we're safe there because, you know, they're not redirecting outside of the site. Well, what if I happen to have found the cross-site scripting attack on, you know, on one page and if I want to get the users there, well, you know, that might be a way to do it is to use uh, redirection within the application to another place in the application. Um, injections. So uh, this is the last area that we uh, you know, have listed in our top five. And injections are still very common. When people usually talk about security, as we mentioned before, this is usually what they think of. Most people think of cross-site scripting, um, SQL injection. And to be honest, while a cross-site scripting still seems to be present, it's not as um, prevalent as it used to be. Um, and uh, you know, I'm starting to see a little bit of it go down. And uh, the other uh, SQL injection, you know, very common in, in the past, not as um, easily found, I would say. It still exists, but sometimes you really have to dig for it to find it. What we're starting to find, again, with some of the latest frameworks um, that uh, are coming out and uh, the way that certain web applications are interacting with backend systems is that there are other forms of uh, injection, and that includes something like a command injection, uh, XML forms of injection, you know, batch scripts, um, and even just some like custom server side code, you know, that the application uh, somehow renders to, to perform a task. I, I remember doing a project um, a few years ago where uh, this one application spun up virtual servers and they had their own sort of custom scripting language and they allowed the user to have limited access to it. And I found that um, just by, you know, ending my allowed command with a semicolon, I was able to sort of brute force some other potential commands. And I eventually came up with a list of uh, commands that I was able to use. And then again, just using that semicolon, which ended my current command, I was able to uh, 
inject uh, several more that executed after that, and you know it, it gave me access to the internal system. So you know there's there's a lot of um, of ways and again languages and things involved, but injections are very common, and um, and there are several ways that you can protect against it. So uh, one of those, um, you know, we, why do they occur? Well, before we can fix them, you know, we need to figure out why they're actually popping up. And, and you know, improper input validation is one of those. Uh, in fact, that's the primary cause. If, if an application is not validating a person's input, and, and the key is to remember that anything that the client enters and sends to the server should always be suspect. So um, regarding input validation, it's very important that the application perform um, you know, validation of whatever is being put in. And it needs to do so not just, say, at that point of submission, but also for every boundary that that um, you know, input will cross. And so we're talking like, let's say that a person's in a registration page and they put in um, you know, a username and uh, email and all that. Well, let's say a malicious person tries to put in some SQL injection code. Well, the first thing that needs to happen, and not just on the client side, because remember, anything, any type of client side scripting that you're using for validation can be completely bypassed. There's still a place for it, you know, especially with regards to formatting, but, you know, you want to do more. So let's say that, you know, they submit this information, has tainted SQL injection into it, they submit that to the server, well, there needs to be a check right there to make sure that it doesn't contain, say, like a single quote or, or something like that that could potentially um, be used by that backend database system. And it needs to keep occurring through each boundary. So if that information, it needs to do a check, and if it passes, it sends it on. And if it touches another server before it you know, actually renders, it needs to be checked. Um, and that's why we call it boundary checking. You know, for every boundary that that input will cross, it needs to be checked and validated to make sure that it is acceptable. Um, you know, so those are uh, two of the issues right there of why they occur. Um, the other one is external libraries. So, so often people will, again, extend their application with, um, you know, libraries we talked about using like jQuery and, uh, and things like that. They might, somebody might have found a really cool third party library that does something just amazing. And they implement it, they include it in their code, but they don't realize that, you know, that library wasn't exactly checked very well and it introduces several injection vectors. So those, are the common reasons that we typically see injections. And then of course the next slide we've actually talked about a little bit, how do we prevent them? Um, um, actually that's probably the one next, but uh, here we are with some examples first. And this is kind of simple to uh, what we mentioned before. Uh, let's see here, we have a username, Bob, and an email, a user street. Um, so here we have an example of how to potentially abuse that. If there's no, you know, input validation check, and I put in that script code, you know, if it actually processes, the server processes it and renders it on the next page, um, then we could potentially get a, a little pop-up like that, and, and of course, that's benign. I mean, that's a very benign example of what could occur. You know, more sinister examples could be, you know, introducing some sort of a browser hook or, um, again, let's say that HTTP only cookie is not that stealing a cookie or redirecting a person to a malicious, malicious page. Um, you know, uh, if it's, you know, they could put the code in there in reference to like an admin user to try to perform an admin function, which at that point could even turn into some form of a cross-site request forgery. Um, and then here we go. So now this is where we were talking about, you know, what can you do? And, and again, we've, we've spoken about some of this. Uh, implementing proper validation checks, including between boundaries. One of the biggest items I found is not using a, um, a blacklist, which is, is very common where a person will blacklist a certain character. There are way too many characters out there um, that, um, you know, a person can use to try to execute these attacks. So it's better to have a whitelist of these are the only allowed specific characters and anything not on that list should be banned. 
Um, testing any third-party add-ons is definitely a must. And um, thinking about how the application, um, you know, touches the back end and the services. I always tell people when they're developing um, and when they're testing to every page, every interaction, think about what is involved. If Again, we're at the user registration page. I'm putting this data in. Where does it go when I hit send? What exactly happens when I hit send? Try to map out that process in your brain or write it down on paper, and then that will potentially allow you to think of different vectors of attack and areas that you need to check. And lastly, of course, have at least an annual penetration test performed. You know, that, that is going to be what's really helpful. Let people who specialize in this every day, who research this stuff every day, you know, attack that application as an attacker would and try to help you by finding these issues. So that is actually the end of uh, my part of the presentation. I hope that you've enjoyed that information. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, you can definitely reach out to us. But I'm going to turn it back over to Ashlyn. And again, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Stuart. Um, if you are interested, we do offer web application penetration testing services. And if you have any questions regarding our methodologies, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you do have any other questions, um, about this webinar, you can go ahead and send them in using the Q&A feature in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we'll be sure to get back to you within 24 hours, or you can reach out to Stuart directly using his email on the screen. I do just want to remind everyone that we will be having more of these Think Like a Hacker webinars over the next few months, so please stay tuned um, for updates on those. Thank you all so much again for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.